Hi, I've never made a post on here before. I wouldn't have said before all this that I was really a believer in the supernatural. In fact, I mostly came here to get a cheap thrill off spooky stories and laugh at the more ridiculous ones made up by gullible loons. Guess that's karma for you. I'm only doing this because I have no clue where else to turn. My story is absolutely off the wall insane. I don't really expect anyone to believe me. I don't know what I want. I just want to make sure that if I turn up dead tomorrow, someone out there will know about it, about what really happened to me. I'm not even sure myself, to be honest. Maybe I am going crazy. I definitely feel crazy. I've started doing things like crouching under my desk while I write and leaving little notes under the floorboard. I stole a knife from the kitchen and hid it under my pillow, just in case. I started wearing a rosary and praying before I go to bed. My internet history is a mess of occult nonsense and stuff that'll definitely have me on an FBI watch list. I have a bag packed, but I can't leave yet. I have to pick my moment. If I don't do this exactly right, I'm a goner. So anyway, my story. I'll stop stalling and try to get it down in as much detail as possible. I live in the southwest of England, in a little village in the back end of nowhere, where everyone knows everyone else. There's no way of getting in and out, except if you have a car, and I haven't got round to passing my test yet. My only access to the nearby village is via the bus, which comes about three times a day, if you're lucky, and whenever my parents decide to drive me, or my sister. My sister, I'll call her Abby. Abby has always been the kind of black sheep of the family. I always thought she was kind of cool, but she annoyed me too, and we got into a lot of arguments. Mostly because she had a habit of hugging all the attention by worrying mum and dad and getting into fights and stuff, while the only rebellious things I've really done is staying up all night playing League of Legends. She believed in things like legalizing weed and anarchy, always got into arguments with our parents, she was nice though, behind it all. You could tell. She would do anything for anyone if they needed a favour, and she always kept a promise no matter what. I'll just start with what I think is the beginning. It all started about a year and a half ago. I'm certain of it. It was a weeknight and I was watching TV. Everyone else had gone to bed. I was in the front room, alone. It must have been near to midnight because I was dozing off. I was startled awake by a rapid knock at the door. This was pretty terrifying for obvious reasons. And I hesitated for a moment before getting up. But then I reasoned with myself to stop being a baby and toughen up. I tried to look outside the window. And I saw a figure standing at the door. I saw the outline of a man, kind of hunched over. There was little else I could make out, so I went to the door. He knocked again. Heart dumping, I steeled myself and opened the door just enough that I could see out, but not much more. He was a lot less scary than I'd imagined. He looked about 45, but well kept for his age. Like the lines on his face were barely there, and he was well dressed. Oddly well dressed, really for the kind of person we usually come across in the countryside. He greeted me by name, which was weird, but he told me he was a friend of my mother's. I believed him, because my mum often had dinner parties and we had guests that I often didn't recognise and never saw again. Still, I hesitated to do anything, like open the door any further or do anything except stare at him uneasily. He pressed again, politely, asking if I'd invite him in. It was at that moment I realised that he was clutching a hand to his stomach, and he was straining to stand upright. I still didn't answer, but luckily my mum turned up behind me before I had to. She seemed just as surprised to see this random man on our doorstep, but they greeted each other like old friends. Then, when he lifted his hand to show her where he'd been apparently hit by a car, a hit and run apparently, she let him in immediately and started gushing in the way I recognised from when I came to her with an injury when I was little. I admit, 
I decided I didn't like him very much at that moment. You have to understand that it's a natural response when you see your mother getting all doughy-eyed over a handsome stranger. I didn't need to worry, because my dad was close behind, and soon they were ushering him upstairs and telling me to go to bed. I didn't know what else to do, so I obliged. It was a creepy situation, but I must admit, I didn't think too much of it. My parents seemed to trust him, so I did too. It was that simple. I still locked the door to my room that night. I pressed my ears up against the wall to the spare room, hearing a lot of commotion and hushed murmuring voices, but little more than that. I wish I'd been brave enough to just go in and pry some answers out of him, but despite my curiosity, I was a little too freaked out to do so. I just popped a sleeping pill and went to sleep. I found out who he was at breakfast the next day. A family friend, like I'd thought, who'd got into trouble and needed to stay here for a few days. I asked why he had to stay here and not hospital, but they just fobbed me off with an answer about him not having anywhere else to go until his Airbnb in the town was ready. I didn't see him at all, really, except in the evenings when he turned up to dinner. Abby was just as freaked out by him and made her feelings on this random guy's presence known, but her apprehension didn't last long. He was really charming, you see. Really neat and intelligent. Charming as hell. He knew all the best ways to fire back at Abby with a quick witted response when she got snarky and seemed to understand all the best ways to gain her respect. Soon, it wasn't her and me sat sullenly at the end of the table while my parents discussed current affairs and philosophy and whatever, but her chipping in with her opinions too. It was only listening to those two talk that I realized how smart she was. I think our parents were really proud to watch her engage with the guy. He gave us stuff to read and they spent hours talking. She went up to his room a lot and I could hear them talking and laughing into the early hours when everyone else had gone to sleep. Don't ask me if I think there was anything going on. I don't want to think about it. I told myself that he wouldn't do something like that. Mum and Dad wouldn't let it happen either. They weren't stupid. I didn't get involved. No one even seemed to notice I was there in those weeks. I just slipped into the background. I didn't mind. I probably wasn't half as interesting to him, being a spotty, grumpy teenage boy and all. Anyway, eventually he did leave much to my personal relief. But he didn't leave our lives. He turned up periodically every week to dinner parties. I'd be forced to join for the meal, but afterwards I'd be excused and return to my room, hearing them talking in low voices well into the night. I learned to sleep with headphones on. Things went on like this for a while. A few months passed and he was gone. Abby was really torn up about him, but mum and dad just told us that they were just as confused as her, and he'd gone away suddenly, without an explanation. He wasn't fond of tech either, so they didn't have a number to call him on, just a vague hope he'd eventually turn up again. I was very glad when he didn't. It seemed like things were going back to normal. Mum and dad were, at least. Abby, not so much. Not at all, actually. She got weird, sad, intense, more intense than usual anyway. She didn't want to debate with anyone about anything. She stopped going to school, stopped doing anything except smoking outside a bedroom window. She almost looked like she was going grey. Her eyes sunk into her sockets and she started losing a lot of weight. My parents thought she was depressed and got her a therapist, medication, anything. I thought she was doing meth but I never found any drugs in her room, apart from a regular weed stash. Soon, she wasn't doing much of anything besides lying in her bed, smoking. She turned her room into a hot box, and my parents gave up trying to do anything about it, so the house constantly stank of bonfires. It was rancid. She was rancid. I started wishing the old bugger would return and pull her out of it, but no amount of wasting away and pining worked. So, she started getting irritable, snapping at everyone. She'd lose her temper at the slightest thing, throw stuff, 
and once even threatened one with a knife. She snapped out of it, dropped it, and started sobbing on the kitchen floor. All I could do was cower in the doorway like a coward when I saw the whole thing from the next room. I'm not proud of it, but if you've never been in a situation like that, you can't really know how you'd react, so don't go judging me. I've never been a fighter. I can't say I wasn't going through it myself, watching my sister deteriorate like that and go mental. I started having panic attacks, hiding in my room even more, keeping a knife on me. But like I say, I was invisible. I shouldn't have worried really. It all came to a head one evening when mum and dad got back from work and she had locked the door to her room. They had to break it down to get in. I don't know how to describe to you what she looked like. She scratched up her arms to the point they looked like raw meat. Blood was smeared everywhere. The walls, the bed, the carpet. She was staring, vacant, just staring at the door. It was dad who broke the silence with a little strangled noise. She leapt into action, literally leapt, pounced like an animal. She was snarling, shrieking, spitting, absolutely unrecognizable from the sister I knew and loved. I was sobbing, shaking, could hardly do anything as dad wrestled her to the ground. It took both mom and dad to get her to stop spasming and writhing, but eventually she went limp. I just stared. They looked at each other, stricken, but then their expressions morphed into something else. Clarity? Determination? I don't know. They eventually seemed to remember I was there and turned to tell me to call my friend and have him pick me up. When I came back the next day, mum and dad were waiting for me. They sat me down in the front room. I remember they were calmer than I ever could have expected, putting up a front for me when they were probably terrified themselves. They told me not to worry, that they'd restrained her. She was safe now. They'd had someone come and assess her. That if we told anyone what happened, they'd lock her up forever. And we didn't want that. Because what had happened to her, it was unexplainable by science. And I knew from the way she looked that they were right. There was no taking her to anyone else. They found all sorts of occult books under her bed. Dark magic, stuff like that. I told them with some conviction that it was definitely that guy that had upped and left town a while ago. But they shut me down firmly. But I knew he'd given her those books. I just knew. Just like I knew I had a possessed sister in the attic. I'm ashamed once again to say that I didn't go up there for a whole two weeks. It became horribly easy to ignore the sound she made. The thumps, the howling, the sobbing. I put my headphones in like I had before and blotted it out. I cried. My panic attacks got worse. I prayed for God to put her out of her misery for the first time in my life. No such luck. It's amazing what you can get used to when you have to what your brain blots out for you to survive. My parents would try to keep up a sense of normalcy for my sake. In a weird way, it made us closer. They started actually asking about the stuff I liked, and I was weirdly chatty. I'd even come into their room sometimes when the banging started, and they'd let me stay like I was five years old again, scared over a tree banging on my window, rather than my crazy sister in the attic. And every day, I thought about that man. What I'd do to him if I ever saw him again. It was five days ago that I finally snapped. It was a Saturday and my parents were out. The banging started up, the weeping, the moaning. I stiffened and reached for my headphones. But then I heard her calling out my name for the first time. Begging, pleading with me. She sounded so scared, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't ignore it this time. Summoning up every ounce of bravery inside me, I made her a sandwich. My favourite, Nutella spread with the crusts off. I pulled down those stairs to the attic, legs jelly, and climbed. 
I'll never forget what I saw up there. The smell was putrid. It took everything not to vomit on the ground in front of me. Abby was soaked through, either with sweat, urine, blood, or anything else. I don't know what I expected, but seeing her physically chained to the wall wasn't it. I had no idea when mum and dad had converted her attic into a dungeon. It was almost professional. She was whimpering. I don't think she saw me at first, and I had to call her name three times from across the room before she finally seemed to see me. Whatever had been in her eyes that night when she went at mum's throat, it wasn't there anymore. She sobbed in relief seeing me, and it all spilled out of her at once. That it was her fault to let her go, and the only reason she attacked in the first place was because mum had been hurting her. That that guy had changed them somehow. I just stared at her in pure horror. She kept talking, crying, begging for me to believe her. Of course, her speech was muddled and disjointed as she rushed to get her words out, but there wasn't even a hint of a lie in her tone. I don't know how long I stood there, not moving. I think I just willed myself out of my body, but there was no escaping this nightmare of a situation. Her pleas grew more incessant until she was screaming at me. I still didn't move, not an inch, not until I felt hands on my arms pulling me back towards the stairs, ushering me down them until I was on the landing. Mom and Dad had returned. I hadn't even heard the door slam. They hardly looked shaken. They had that expression of absolute calm. As I started to hyperventilate, my mother took me in her arms and shushed me, trying to calm me down. They reassured me that she was lying, whatever she said, that she was really sick and I didn't need to worry, to forget about it. They were calling a priest, you know, to exercise her properly, and it would all be over. I was so relieved to be out of there that I believed her almost immediately. Please don't judge me. You know, I realized after all this how much of a kid I still am. A lot of kids my age think that they're invincible, that they've got no more growing they could possibly do, that they're independent and ready to take on the world. I used to be like that. I wanted my mum to be right. I wanted her to make it all go away. Of course, I wanted Abby to get better. I just didn't want to be the one to do it. And she said she had it under control. That she definitely would. They both did. The priest never came. The noises died down from the attic until they lulled completely. It was just me, mum and dad, sat at the dinner table quietly, and everything felt normal. It felt like... It was like I fell into a trance. I don't even remember time passing. I just remember smooth, low voices, the smiling of faces of my family. Days blurred into weeks. I don't know if it was depression or... something. I don't know what. It was weird. I was drained, constantly. Not even half myself anymore. I'm ashamed to say my memory even got spotty. Like, I went long stretches of time, having even forgotten about the memories of the past few months. I started finding weird rashes in my arms, like I'd scratched them to hell. Then, I started finding even weirder marks, like little puncture wounds all over my body, cropping up from time to time. Mom and Dad were cooing over me constantly, giving me anything I asked for, feeding me up so much that I started putting on weight. I say that like it's definitely a bad thing, but, well, eventually, I snapped out of it. I realized I'd gone days, weeks, without hearing Abby. I tentatively asked my parents about how we were going to treat her, when they were going to call the church and get someone to help, or track down the old guy. But they just exchanged looks, and Mum gave me one of her glassy-eyed smiles. Don't worry, she said. You don't have to worry about her anymore. None of us will. 
I waited until they were gone to look. I went up to the attic, shaking, terrified, but it was spotless. No sign of the nightmarish setup from before. No chains. Only the faint smell of disinfectant. My sister was gone. And I realized what I'd done. What they had done. I turned the whole house upside down after that. I don't know what I was looking for. But I was desperate for any clues. Any signs that I wasn't going insane. That my sister existed. Going through my drawers. Ransacking them. I found something, stuffed right at the back. A small glass bottle, full of dirt and weeds, and a picture of me stuffed inside. A weird looking symbol etched in permanent marker on the side. It was then that I really started to freak out. Needless to say, I disposed of that thing before my parents could find them. It's the day after now. I'm still in my family home and I haven't slept in 24 hours. Got to keep up appearances. I already feel clearer. Clearer than I have since they locked Abby up. I've searched everywhere for those occult books of Abby's that they showed me, but I can't find them. I need some sources, some ammunition, or anything you guys have. Anything as to what the hell is going on. Either my parents are Satanists, or my sister was a witch and they murdered her. I don't know which is worse. I need to leave home. I know that much. But I've got nowhere to go. Nowhere, anyway, that they wouldn't be able to follow me to. I'm just a stranger on the internet. I'm not expecting anything. But, well, I figured it's worth a shot. Please, help me.